when there were fewer upsets in the tournament? I, I think this this year, if if that, I I guess that wave of upsets is probably over right now, or it still could happen. It still could happen, I guess. But uh, no, I think it's more of an aberration than anything. That every year that's going to happen, you're going to have some. You're not going to have some. No, I think if anything, it's going it'll go the other way, because of the attrition to the pros, because of transfers. You, you you take a whole bunch of juniors and seniors who are mid-major players and play a bunch of freshmen who have who have people calling them about the NBA the next day and they're in the NCAA tournament. Uh, that's really hard. And so there's going to be you just stay tuned. There'll be this this March Madness will always be March Madness. Some years it just be madder than others. Right here, what we got. I uh, want to follow up on the players making plays rather than running plays. Mm -hmm. What about time and score considerations? How, how does that factor in on when to do something, when not to do something? Well, that, that's a, uh, because of the shorter shot clock right now, that's been a thing. We've had a couple of times where we really played out of our minds and had these 20-point leads against really good teams uh, with 10 minutes to go. That's, you'd think that's, a coach feels good, that's the worst time for a coach. You know, because you're, you're, you're knowing you don't want to keep just running and gunning because maybe you're going to, you know, two threes, three threes, and it's a 12-point game with nine to go. And it, it can happen in, in, a matter, in a blink of an eye. So that's that sweet spot there. What am I going to do? It's just like football again. We just don't have as much time to think about it, right? That, or am I going to – it's third. There's third and three. Am I, am I going to pass this one and maybe get an incomplete, or am I going to make, take more time off the clock? And that's, that's the tough thing for us. Um, because you don't see as much pressing right now because you're relying on that clock. But getting those shots, getting – when, when do you stop sending guys the offensive boards and just send them back to protect? And you usually can hang on to the lead, but we had a game with uh, uh, Purdue this year. I mean, they, sc they scored two old-fashioned – we were up 18. They scored two old-fashioned threes and two three-point plays in like a minute. And it was six, just like that. And we had had some pretty good shots, but we didn't go in. Yeah. Uh, I think you got to be very careful about when you pull the plug, uh, but pe people can come back so quickly. All right. Paul Schwartz with the New York Post. John, in your um, experience, when you know, one of your teams comes off such a good shooting display, 16 three-pointers, yeah. do you figure, all right, they're going to be confident and do it again, or do you worry it's not going to be there, the other team's clued in on it? You know, do you worry it's kind of yeah. like fool's gold? I, I, I worry about everything in life, okay? So that's, that's a bad question for me. But I, 16, I, I, I'm not saying, hey, hey, we're going to go make 16 again. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking if we get good shots, let's go. And, sh and if we shoot, can shoot 35 to 45% from three, we're going to be in a lot of games, right? But we got to get those shots too. People take away your threes, like that, that is another issue. So you have to, then you got to drive the ball and you got to say, we're not doing it. We've we got to drive it. They're out, they're extending. Now we got to drive by people, right? Or run different action to get. Get, uh, things going to the rim or passing action to the rim. So uh, we are, you know, we're, I think, even though people will think we're this three-point shooting machine, I think we're really flexible at doing what we need to do uh, to be in, be able to be in position to be in position to win a game. All right, back here. Uh, Myron Metcalf, ESPN. Uh, John, how far do you think we are from, you know, the college rules embracing all of the NBA rules, the three-point line, the, the shot clock, at yeah. what point do you think that will happen? Yeah, I, uh, we're certainly trending that way, Myron, but uh, I just I hope we don't go to the 24. I, I just think there's a certain element there that um, it's these, – these kids right, – that, that, that the action is going to be more up and down, right? The NBA guys aren't going to classes all day long, right? And they're not getting back at 2 in the morning and have an 8 o'clock calculus class or a chemistry class or sociology class. I, I just hope we got to keep the beauty of this thing that it's, it's probably in a good spot right now where it is, and because there's, because of the, the, our new strengths in basketball are technology. Because of those strengths, these kids, their time demands are even, are, are even more in flux. So I, I, I think when we go to that, right, I think that now we're, 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 it's more times up and down the court, up and down the court, more times in practice, up and down the court. I think it's dangerous to go too much in that level. But I think we gotta still put our kids in position so they're ready for the NBA. That's a key thing. Right, but I think we can do that in a gradual thing, just like, you know, the minor leagues in baseball. They're, no, they're not ready in, in the minor leagues, but it'll be, it won't be long before they're ready. Put them in position to be in that position. Right here. 
John, I, I think you've faced a Patino coach team four times in your career. I wonder what you find is the unique challenge to prepare for his team, and are they much different than they were in the 13 title game? I, I think they've been very similar in all the times. I, I even faced him when I was a Canisius coach uh, at, when he was at Kentucky. Uh, so uh, it's all, you're always prepared for multiple defenses uh, because they're, they're going to they're gonna come out, they're going to play full-court pressure. Sometimes they're going to trap, sometimes they're going to run and jump. Um, they're going to uh, play hard pressure, sometimes soft pressure. You're, you're going to see you know, some type of full-court, just soft stuff. So we're always, and you're going to see a matchup zone, regular zone. You're going to see regular man-to-man, -man, switching man-to-man. -man. I mean, we've seen all those things. In a one-day prep, it's hard, but it's hard for both teams. So, uh, but that's, that's been pretty consistent with Rick. And I think that, you know, we had, he, he's about the same age as I am, and we sort of got into the game differently, but to where we are, just by being coaching nomads a little bit, that Dean, the Dean Smiths, uh, that we go at the clinics, the John Woodens that they played multiple defenses. They so John Wooden used to press. Dean Smith was always, you know, had a multiple defense. Those were the clinics that he went to, that I went to, and it just helps you evolve as a young coach. And uh, so he's he's kept some of that. We used to be one three one zone and back to a man. We used to change more than we do now, uh, but uh, I liked winning more, so we stopped playing so much one three one. Right. Everybody got used to the one three one because it, it it used to be big and then people got used to it. Right. Uh, Jeff Greer from the Louisville Courier Journal. Uh, you've only had a day to look at film for Louisville, but what are your thoughts on number twenty two, Dang Adele, the, the small forward? Yeah, he's a. He, I like what I see from him because his length is incredible. He can shoot it just enough where you have to guard him. He's a perfect complement to the two guards, but his length is really really um, good. And I you know I think that they've played him on guards before as well. So, uh, very versatile player. Right here. Coach Michigan Insider, Mark Dodson, how are you? Good, Mark. I, uh, Derek Walton now is a household name in a lot of college basketball fans' uh, households. And I'm curious as to, especially over the last month or so, um, he's been picked up. So, has it been a situation where Derek has just been exposed and now people are, are, are becoming familiar with him, or has he always been this good? And if he's been this good, what do you attribute his, uh, his, his play recently to? Uh, no, I, I think that his, his involvement as a player, his evolution as a player, has uh, is, is really uh, uh, sp a spike this year, where you've seen the biggest spike, in that he wanted to win so badly. And uh, he's had a lot of help with that, where he's got a, a great staff. I think that Billy Dylan's had a great influence on him. Greg Harden, the famous Greg Harden, who is uh, who is counseled the Tom Brady's and the Desmond Howards of the world, is has spoken with a lot a lot with him about him getting everything that he can out of that that, that his the blessings he's had. Uh, actually, I think people starting to switch def switch man to man and say my seven footer or my six eight guy can guard their point guard. I think he took it personally, and said, I, "Wait a minute, I got a lot more to my game because that's really." It, that was part of where this whole thing started, is where people start, thought they could just guard him with a big man in a pick-and-roll situation. And he said, all right, now uh, coach just wants me to shoot it or drive it. And that's really been helpful. But the young man's worked hard. You know, we wear these um, uh, catapult system on our back that measures how hard you work that day in practice. And uh, his was off. His was leading every, every practice every day the first month of the season. It was like at 1,100. We try to not let him get over 500 right now or 400. And it's halfway through practice. I see he's at six or he's at five hundred, and we got to shut him down. He's just a worker, and that's been the other component of his growth. We've got time for a couple more. <coughs> right, right here. John, Zach, DJ, and Derek, we're talking about how importantly you treat turnovers in practice. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about Louisville's pressure defense and how turnovers may play into the key of the game tomorrow? Yeah, th this is, uh, you know, a, a part that uh, we have to take care of. It. You know, it's a game of possessions. And where we, because we, we, we have a lot of skilled players, we can accept some of the fact that we might get out-rebounded. But if you out-rebounded us by six or seven, and we have seven less turnovers, we all had the same possessions. So that's very, very important. If you're out-rebounding us and we're giving it back to you, we're in trouble. So we got to make sure that we really take care of the ball because – 
if, you, if you're going to trap us, if you're going to try and turn us over, well, we're one pass away from a basket, right, if we can just make that one pass. So I think we probably work at pivoting and passing as much as anybody in the country. And it, it, the kids are coming in and, and because it's, it's, it's just old school camp stuff. I mean, that you do it if you had a four year old, a, a fourth grade team, you say, you teach them how to pivot, which I don't, it seems like we get a lot of play, players that don't know how to pivot. Now they pivot out of that pressure, and now it, their defense can create our offense. Louisville's thing will be their defense going to create their offense. We can't let that happen tomorrow. Thank you, John. Thank you. Louisville uh, players will be in in about 10 minutes at 2.20.
For those of you in the media work area, we're about uh, three or four minutes away from Louisville. Players VJ King, Anas Mahmood, and Ray Spaulding. The University of Louisville players are on their way to the interview room.
guys. Okay, we have been joined by the University of Louisville players, B.J. King, Anas Mahmood, and Ray Spalding. And if you will raise your hand, get a, we'll get a mic to you. And the Louisville locker room is now open. Any questions? Yeah, Pat. Uh, Pat Forty from Yahoo Sports for uh, for Anas and, and Ray. Uh, what stands out on film and what you saw yesterday from Michigan, and specifically their offense? Honest. Um, they shoot the ball really well uh, in all five positions. Um, watching film yesterday, we realized that we have to limit their attempt, not even contest it. We have to make him do something else other than shoot the three. Ray? Uh, very similar to what Anna said. They're a very well shooting basketball team. Uh, they play very aggressive. Uh, defensively, they got a lot better defensively coach set this team this year, so um, we we'll really look forward to attacking them. Yeah, right here. Myron Metcalf, ESPN. For, for BJ, uh, you know, rough start in the game yesterday. How will, important will it be to, you know, reverse that and avoid that uh, in tomorrow's game against Michigan? BJ? Um, I think we kind of started off slow just because of kind of the first game of the tournament, just uh, – Kind of it was just jitters. It's like it, that lasted throughout the whole first half, but we definitely picked it up and started playing our game. Um, but we have to get out, go off to a fast and a good start this game because if we get down to a team like like Michigan, they'll they'll really put it on us, and it'll be hard to to come back if we dig a hole like that. So we gotta it's important for us to start off strong and just start off focused. Questions, please. Right here. Uh, Neil Best from Newsday. How have you guys uh, fared in your in your minds against th this type of team that relies on the three? I mean, do you think it's a good matchup for you? VJ, we'll start with you. Um, definitely. Uh, they play at sort of the pace we like to play at with their um, with the way they shoot the ball, but it's going to be difficult uh, for us to uh, to guard that. Just we have to, like Anna said earlier, to limit the attempts and just lock in on defenses. Offense come and goes, but if we if we play the, the defense that we know how to play every single game, we give our chance to the best chance to, to win. Honest. Uh, I mean, just like Vijay said, they play similar, uh, um, you know, game team. Uh, they they don't push the pace too much, but uh, they're uh, really opportunistic. Uh, they're open. They're gonna take a shot, and uh, it, just like Vijay said, it's gonna come down to defense. We're gonna get more stops, and we're gonna attack them in transition, and gonna come with the win. Right. Yeah, just like what uh, Anas and VJ said, they uh, play similar to our tempo, the game play we like to play. Uh, they really shoot the ball well, and I think uh, the way we play defense and how we're going to lock in today with our scouting and practice today, uh, we really look forward to trying to stop that. More questions, please? Right back here. Just out of curiosity, Rick Pitino compared them to the Golden State Warriors. Who would you compare your team to? What NBA team? Ray, we'll start with you. In terms of style. <laughs> uh, in terms of style, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm more of a Sacramento Kings fan, so I don't know who really can pass Sacramento Kings. I'd have to say, uh, let's go with the Cavs. I like the Cavs matchup. <laughs> Honest? Uh, it's tough to compare, you know, college to, to the league, especially we focus so much on defense. I don't, I don't think people in NBA focus as much on defense as, you know, college basketball do. Um, we always talk that we try to pass the ball as, as well as the, you know, the Spurs pass the ball and move the basketball well. So um, I hope we can, you know, reach the, that level. VJ? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um I don't want to just throw out a team because I'm. I don't want to say the wrong the wrong thing, but I'm just go with what what those two said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We had right here. Obviously, your coach has been coaching these tournaments since you know long before you guys were born. Did, do you feel that uh, when you're you know when he's preparing you and talking to you, do you get that sense of just that vast you know knowledge and experience he's bringing to this? VJ. Um, 
Definitely, uh, just because it's, it's definitely tournament time, he's, he's definitely turning it up a notch. But with him, it's, it's always the same with how he prepare, with how he coaches, with just his intensity and passion. It's, it's the same with every team. If we were playing you know, the first game or exhibition game to a team like, you know, a game like we're playing tomorrow, it's always the same. But it's, he's definitely turning it up a notch because he wants to win. He sees the potential in us and he knows how far we can go if we, we just play the, the way we're capable of. So, Honest? Um, you know, since I've been here, everything Coach P told us in practice happens in games. Uh, whenever we have a bad practice, he comes up to us and you guys are going to have a bad game tomorrow because we had a bad practice yesterday. And it just always happens. And uh, we kind of picked up on that and uh, we just listened to him as well as we could. Um, and just like DJ said, he, he really picked it up uh, going into the ACC tournament after our first loss and uh, playing and close last week before the, um, before the NCAA started. And because uh, he knows that we, how how far we can go, and uh, just he he's really picking it up on us. So. Next, please. Oh man, anyone? Oh, oh you, you, do you want? To right? <laughs> no, sir. no, sir. They covered it. They covered it. You good? <laughs> yes, okay. sir. All right. Next question, right here, in the front. Mark Dyson with the Michigan Insider. Describe the, the processes you guys follow after in, in one of these tournament type atmospheres. When you come off a game, describe what you do. Maybe when you got a game the next day, or as, you, as is the case with Michigan tomorrow, describe the processes you guys go through. In other words, do you start preparing for a team like Michigan, anticipating that you'll be playing them, or do you wait until after you play the game and and then you start preparing? And then what that prepare, what that preparation consists of? Ray. Uh, definitely with Louisville, um, preparation is very key in this program. Uh, we go by three R's, refuel, refresh, recover. Uh, we really focus on that. Um, once we won the game yesterday, you know, it was on to the next one. So we uh, dial into who we play, who we could potentially play. Like uh, before we even came to the tournament, just like preparation that the coaches were going through and the scouting report they have for us on several different teams that we could occur to play. Were, like, it was crazy, but um, we really prepared well. Uh, honest? Um, yeah, we, we never really skip any team. Um, you know, come in last week, we we looked at the bracket, we see who we potentially can play, but we never really prepared to any other team other than uh, Jacksonville State because, I mean, and nothing is guaranteed when you go to the tournament. You have to win every game. Um, you have to play game by game. And at last, year, last, last, uh, last night after the game, we went home and ate dinner, and then we started watching film in Michigan. And, you know, today we have a scouting practice, and. And just this how our program is. We we don't skip any games, and we literally you know prepare for every single game. So, right here, front. Yeah. Uh, for Ray and DJ, uh, your minutes seem to fluctuate from game to game. Yesterday you played a lot. Do you think it's matchup based or how you perform in practice? What what uh, determines your role, and and how do you see it from game to game? Ray. Uh, really. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I guess I have a coach's feeling with the game, how the game style is played and how the game is going on with uh, substitutions and minutes is upon him. You know, uh, really, I don't look into the minutes and points being scored. I just, my jersey number is called and I'm told to go in. I just look to produce in some type of way. DJ? Um, yeah, some of the what Ray said, uh, it's not really about, you know, um, how we perform in practice, but just how the game's going on with foul trouble and just the flow of the game. But like you said, whenever our names are called, just be ready for our, however long it is, just for us to come in and try to contribute in the best ways we can, however long we're out there. Anything else for the guys? OK, seeing none, fellas, you're dismissed. Thank you. Thank See you tomorrow. And then we'll get Coach Patino is scheduled for 240, but we'll see how soon he gets here.
Okay, for those of you in the media work area, we are about to be joined by Coach Patino. All right, Coach Patino is here, so raise your hands and we'll, we'll get started. Right here. As one of the pioneers of the use of three-point shots in this tournament or in the game in general, what, what do you make of the continuing evolution of that to where Michigan shot more threes than twos, you know, both the college and the pro level? Are, are you surprised it took this long? Well, the amazing thing to me is you look at the size of the players that Michigan has, and they shoot it like backcourt players. That's what's really coming on. You know, I made a concentrated effort this past year to, in our recruiting is to just recruit bigs who could shoot, because we don't have bigs who can shoot now. So we signed kids that number one priority is they could shoot the three-point shot, because it has evolved where 6'10", six, 6'11", six, guys no longer want to play in the post. The other thing that's really interesting about the pros is the, the great centers are all losing in basketball. You know, Dwight Howard's winning a little bit now, and certainly uh, he's up there, but most of the true centers are not winning. Uh, you look at New Orleans and in Sacramento before that, before Cousins left, and it's the small teams that shoot the threes that are all winning. So it's, it has evolved into, from 1987 to now, it's gone through a great change. Right back here. Um, kind of a follow-up to that, uh, I talked to John Beeline about, you know, the college game trending toward sort of the NBA. He said he wouldn't be in favor of a 24-second shot clock. Want to know your thoughts on that. You know, I think it wouldn't be good. I'm in favor of it because I'm... I've coached in the pros, but it wouldn't be good for the game because it, it would take away from the f teaching the fundamentals of basketball, the art of, of passing the right way. In the pros, they, they take a lot of challenge shots, and they're able to make it. You know, one of the re I remember somebody saying one time, Allen Iverson's percentage wasn't very good. I said, yeah, but it's because with five seconds to go, everybody's playing him. He's got to take very difficult shots. And I wouldn't want that to come into our game where everybody's got to take a difficult rush shot all the time. 30 seconds is, is I think, just the right time. Right here. Uh, Rick, you've had some great runs in March. Michigan's on one right now. It actually dates back a little bit into February. How would you define what a March momentum run is like? Well, they have all the ingredients that add up to great runs. They shoot well from the foul line. They shoot well from the field. Um, they're a much improved defensive team as the season's gone on. They're extremely well coached at the fundamentals of the game. And then they have a, as tough a point guard as there is in, in the college game from a mental standpoint. So they've got all the ingredients to understand why they're making such a strong run. Right here. Uh, Rick, you've had a couple of very memorable NCAA tournament games against John Beeline teams. Does this team play like his other ones? I mean, is his style pretty much continuous, or is there changes? Well, that's the, the genius about John Beeline is he... We prepared a different way to play Jacksonville State. This team that we've had, and I've never done this before since I've been a coach, we've almost, against Kentucky, we played a matchup zone. Against Indiana, we played a switching man. Against Jacksonville State, against Wichita State, against um, Purdue, 
We, we played everybody almost different every single night out. And we had a week to prepare because we lost um, in the opening round of the tournament. And with one day prep, this is about as a difficult a task as, as I've faced since I've been a coach because of the way they play. There's nobody similar this year. And we had the number one schedule in the nation that I could say plays like Michigan. Because you have to beat them because if you put them to the line, they're going to make their free throws. If you give them open looks, they're going to make their threes. Uh, if you overplay them, they're going to go back door. Um, so it's, they're truly unique. Right. And it, with one day prep, it's very difficult. Over here. And they only give you an hour and a half practice, too. Rick, in the same vein as oh, over here, in the same vein as that earlier question about Mark Tron, it's been 30 years since your charm run in Providence. What were the endearing moments, memories you still have uh, from that run 30 years ago? Well, it's one of my favorite teams of all time. And the last, I, I've said this about 30 times to the local media, the last two years have reminded me of 1987 as people. Um, it's the closest thing I've seen to, to the type of people. Uh, Damian Lee and Trey Lewis coming in and, and the guys I have now remind me of my Providence team as people. The Providence thing was truly Cinderella. I look back and it's, it's molded my career in thinking that anything is possible. Because when I first took over at Providence, um, I remember as if it's yesterday, sitting with Dick McGuire and Fuzzy Levain as an assistant coach of the Knicks, watching Providence College lose by 30 points, and they carried Joe Mullaney off the court, and they lost by 30 points. And Dick McGuire said to me, he said, you're not considering taking that job. I said, well, because I had both of them watch Providence. They were losing their three um, good players. Billy Donovan did not get in the game or play. And I was meeting Lou Lamarillo, the AD, at the Abbey Tavern in New York City, a block from where I grew up. And I'll never forget it because Dick, uh, Fuzzy, and I talked about you cannot take this job. It's the worst job. Seton Hall and Providence were dead last place since the inception of the Big East. And I knew I couldn't turn this program around. It was too, too, too far down. And Lou Lamarillo sat there with his head down when I walked in. And, and he said, this happens every year. Our people come down by train and they go home after the first round and lose by 30 points. And he said, but I'm gonna change it. I'm gonna change the whole culture. I'm hiring you tonight. And I already made up my mind sitting with Dick and Fuzzy, there's no way I could ever coach this team. And immediately I said, yes, I'll take the job. <laughs> and I never forgot that moment in my life because he patronized me for one sentence and I took the job without talking contract or money. And, and that 87 Providence team, I'll never forget because it made me so positive in thinking anything's possible in the game. And if that team could go to a Final Four, anything's possible. And if Billy Donovan can go from a 190-pound basketball player who I was beating 15 nothing every day one-on-one -on -one, to an All-American, I couldn't even carry his shoes after two years. It was quite special. Right, right here in the white shirt, yes. Eric Crawford, WDRB. Rick, I wonder if you could Describe for me a good challenge of a three-point shot. I see a lot of players that think they're far enough out or whatever and the ball goes in and coaches get on them. What, what are you talking about? Well, about? I was just watching West Virginia Notre Dame and West Virginia guard was taking a shot at least 15 feet behind the line and there was no doubt in his mind it was going in. And you see that a lot. With Michigan, I was, happened to be watching the second half and with the players in the locker room, I think they were four for 15 maybe in the first half, I forgot the exact number. But we all sat there with our mouths open, watching one shot after another from six, seven feet behind the line go in. And um, immediately I saw, saw the team rooting for Oklahoma State. <laughs> right here in the, in the middle, all right. Hey coach, uh, Mark Dodson, Michigan Insider, covering uh, Michigan sports. and. And I'd imagine that most Michigan fans, especially the casual Michigan fans, are quite familiar with your championship team from a couple of years ago when you played Michigan. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how your team plays now, how you, how you might contrast that team and this team 
And then also the two Michigan teams, the one from back then and the one which you see now. Well, as I said in Boston, Gorky Zhang's not walking through that door, and Peyton Seaver and Russ Smith aren't either. Um, and um, it's far different basketball team that we have now compared to that third team. And I would say Michigan in style of plays, you know, there's no Trey Burke and there's some of the players um, uh, that they had right now who are playing in the NBA uh, are far different. That doesn't mean that they're not better or as good. It's just far different. Uh, it's a much different Michigan team uh, in third team than they are now. Um, so we're both different. And um, we obviously had m more seasoning. We had a team that was coming off of Final Four. We went to the Final Four in 12, and then we came back. So this is a team that didn't play in the tournament last year and only had one nine-point scorer returning in Quentin Snyder. So much different team, and I'm sure John would say the same. All right. Yes. Uh, Rick, you have at least a passing relationship with one Big Ten coach who has played against uh, Michigan. Did you get a scouting report from that coach? Well, he's on his way in here, and um, I was actually at the Michigan-Minnesota um, game live where Minnesota won in overtime, and their power forward center, two guard, whatever they call him, made a shot from 15 feet behind the line to put it into overtime as if it was a layup. So I happened to know Michigan very well, and, and Richard said, you know, he gave, he, he gave me his thoughts on, on the game. And uh, I said, well, they've won 10 out of the last 12. And they've, since the time I've seen them, they've gotten a lot more confident and a lot better. And I think it really stems from the play of their point guard. Right back here. Mark Snyder, Detroit Free Press. Rick, you've been obviously offered a lot of jobs over the years. Um, do you ever think back on the Michigan conversations with Bill Martin and wonder what if, or does that not, your mind not go there? You know, it's, I've been really happy at Louisville, um, and Michigan has done quite well for themselves. So it's, um, it was a time that uh, I actually took the Michigan job that morning, and my wife did not want to go for a variety of reasons. She said I was making a decision based on the wrong factors, and she was right, because never, I've never been on that campus before, didn't know the athletic director, and I was taking a job blind to it all. But I thought it was a great job, great university, academically as well as athletically. Just wasn't the right fit for me. Rick, at this stage, how important is execution of whatever the plan is, and how important is just guys who, using their God-given talent to make it happen? You know, Jerry, this is so unique. It's, it's really difficult to gauge because they can beat you so many different ways. They can beat you with cuts. They can beat you on the break. They're a terrific foul shooting team. Like I said, they're a much improved defensive team from the time I've I watched them at Minnesota to even now. Um, you know, people like to like to uh, to say it's because of the trauma they went through with the plane, but I don't think that had anything to do with it. I just, I, I really think that adversity does make you stronger, certainly like that. But I think they just keep evolving into a better basketball team at all phases of the game. But they can beat you so many different ways, um, and that's what it makes it difficult going into this basketball game and. We, we have a scheme that we think will be successful, but you just don't know because of their shooting ability. Right here. Right behind you. Two-part question, Rick. Uh, how has the uh, limit of the, on the shot clock influenced how much you use the press, and how effective is the press at uh, inhibiting three-point shooting just because you don't get quality shots? Well, I would say this year I've seen more teams, what I call soft press, either 2-2-1 two, two, or 1-2-2, two, two, like a Villanova type 1-2-2, two, two, than any time in my coaching career because everybody is trying to get people to take six to eight seconds in the backcourt. So when they come down, they, they have 20 seconds to execute or 18 seconds to execute. That's why I always felt pressing in the pros is much better than college because 
of the 24 second clock. If you can get the team to take six to eight seconds in the backcourt in the pros, basically you got a 14 second offense because they're not going to let it go down. The difficulty is you play 82 games and you can't, it's difficult. And I did it with the Knicks because we had we played 10 guys every night. So it, it's a factor in the game, but you know Shaka Smart tried to press Michigan at VCU and it didn't work too well. And we didn't press too much in 13. We would change a little bit. We didn't press too much. When you have a great shooting passing team, it's pressing can be a big danger. We had to do it last night to beat Jacksonville State, but uh, we're, we're probably not going to press Michigan too much in this game. Tell John that so he doesn't work on his press offense. Paul Schwartz with the New York Post. Uh, Rick, um, a lot of your players when they were up there before were saying um, we have to limit their three-point attempts, you know, not the makes, the attempts. They were 16 for 29. Um, how confident you can, you can take them out of what they want to do by limiting their attempts? It's difficult because when you do that and you crowd a three-point shooter, now if they don't put it on the floor and they're just – a spot-up shooter, but that's not the case with them. They, they put it on the floor great, and then they force you to help, and then when you rotate, they find their open people. So it takes good balance, good intelligence. You, you've got you know, you to stay up all night, and say, uh, your player's got to really be tuned into film work more than practice in seeing how they get it and what they do. But this, very, this team is very difficult to go against. If you said to me right now, out of all the teams in college basketball, who are the two most difficult teams to play against with one day prep, it would be Michigan and West Virginia. Because it's the first time I've seen a team press nonstop on misses. So they're, they're both very, with one day prep. Now if you have four days, it's a, it's a lot easier. Right here. Uh, Rick, just generally, not specific to your game tomorrow. Time and score considerations, are, is that becoming less of a thing? Are players not going with time and score as much as they used to? I'd say that's true, um, especially in, in Oklahoma State, Michigan yesterday. It was, you know, I think a lot of teams are going to go two for one at the end of the, uh, of the half. And, you know, Q told me last night when he's coming in the game, he said, want me to go two for one? I said, yes, go. And um, I think that the three-point shot, I don't think I've seen it one time this year, which is kind of unusual, where you're um, up three and you foul the other team, put them to the line. I haven't seen it one time. I don't know if you, all of you have, but you, I've seen that a lot in past years, but I didn't see it one time in a game this year. I think that although announcers always say it's a good percentage, I mean, I would never do it because I've got really thin leg guys who get pushed underneath on free throws and I would never do it. And I lost the game myself at Kentucky with Mashburn doing it that way. So uh, I would not do it, but the announcers always made such a big deal. But I didn't see one game, and I watched a lot of games this year where that, that came about. Right here. You know, it's one thing you talk about the 87 team in a room where there's a lot of people old enough to remember it. How, how do you balance when you're talking to your guys who are 20, 21 years old using your experience, stories of past teams and players without them kind of rolling their eyes and thinking you're talking about old stuff? Yeah, but I, you know, I, I tell them stories about Bernard King all the time. And I realize as I'm telling them that, they have no clue to who Bernard King was. And my point, what I was trying to make to them was that Bernard, when we came down and we ran our offense, he demanded the basketball by kept yelling, ball, give me the ball, give me the ball, almost every play down the court. We had a play called power right, power left. That means you just get Bernard King the ball. And he demanded it in the way he post up, posted up that the guards throw him the ball. And I was trying to teach our guys post offense, and I said, they're not throwing you the ball because you're not demanding the basketball like Bernard King. And I told him his background. He led the league in scoring. He had three straight 50-point games in Texas on a Texas swing. And now we have done a great job of that in making sure the guards are, they're not selfish, but they will ignore you. Now, you yell out ball three times, they'll be embarrassed that they didn't throw you the ball. So we've done a good job with that. And I tell them all stories about players all the time. They just met Grant Hill, and you would think they would know all about Grant Hill, because <laughs> it, it hasn't been that long. Now, I certainly remember him. 
But uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, I tell them pro stories all the time about guys, and, and uh, we have a good time with it. They're, they're a good group of guys. There's certain teams I've coached I wouldn't tell stories to, but this group is pretty good. Last question right here. Uh, speaking of stories, Coach Beeline has kind of been talking with his team about comparing them to like the 05 team, and you know, that was the team that you guys came back 20 down in the Elite Eight. So, I mean, kind of watching the film, I don't know if you've been able to see the comparison, but what about this current Michigan team kind of reminds you of that John Beeline team? You know, it does in a way. I forgot about that. It does in a way. I'll never forget that, that game. Out of all the games I've ever coached, that one sticks out to me the most of any game I've ever coached because we were playing basically seven players. We never pressed. We never played man. We just played a 2-3 bumping zone, not even a matchup. And our seventh man, Otis George, had a stress fracture, so he didn't practice. So we had to, as soon as we found out we were playing them, we knew we couldn't play them man-to-man. -man. We had to play zone. And they made 11, I remember it correctly, but they made 11 threes. We were down 20. I think we cut it to 12 or 13 right before the half. But they made 11 threes. John's son, uh, pitch snuggles on that team. Uh, John's son made a three from the Lobo. And I went in at halftime. We had to walk up the ramp at the pit. And we moved all the chairs. And I said, guys, you're not going to believe this. We can't play them zone. We're going we're to get killed. And we moved all the chairs. And all we did was go through the Princeton offensive back doors, running the guy into our chest. And we spent, we, we went out with one or two minutes on the clock. And we had a walkthrough in the locker room. We played man-to-man -man for the first time that year. And we were lucky to win it in overtime. Um, but we could not play them zone. They just torched us in what, the way they shot the ball. So I would agree with you that there's a lot of similarities to the way they shot it and the way this team shoots it. Thanks, Coach. See you tomorrow. We'll have Wichita State in about 10 minutes.
I don't have a, I don't have their roster. Hey, hey, wait, I got right here. Your Kelly, okay. That Shannon. Yeah. For those of you in the media area, Wichita State is sending Connor Frankamp, Landry Shamit, and Richard Kelly.
Okay. For those of you in the media area, Wichita State players are on their way. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good, how are you guys? Doing good. Good. All right, Wichita State's players are here. Uh, just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Right here. Hey, uh, how much is that 2014 game against Kentucky? How much is it talked about, you know, referred to as kind of a big moment? this program's history and your guys' experiences at Wichita State? Connor, we'll start with you. Um, it's not talked about too much, honestly. Um, obviously, it was a very historic game against two really good teams. Um, but both teams are different now, and, and it, it's just a new game for us now, pretty much. Landry? Uh, I mean, the only talk we've really done on it, we, we watched a little bit of film on on it, just a few similarities here and there. But like Connor said, it's two very different teams now. Richard? Yeah, um, personally, none of us was involved at 35 and 0 year besides our two seniors. So, I mean, we, we personally wasn't there, but we knew how, how much the state of Wichita, the fan base will love it. Right here. Bob Lutz, Wichita Eagle. Do you, any of you guys get caught up at all looking ahead in the bracket and that some of the teams that are, are in Wichita State's path? Richard, we'll start with you. Uh, no, nah, we, uh, we treat every uh, team with the same amount of respect, you know, one team at a time. And just like the game, you know, it's just one play at a time, one possession at a time. So we don't try to get too ahead of ourselves and just worry about the task in front of us. Landry? Yeah, you, you can't afford to look ahead. Uh, your full attention has got to be on the team you're currently pitted against, and that's, that's what we try to do. Okay, right here. Uh, for all three of you guys, how, how accurate would it be to consider you guys an execution team? Connor? 
Um, it's, it's decently accurate. Uh, we really try to focus in on making sure we run our sets right and, and doing what the coach says. But um, we also have guys who can go and get, get a bucket pretty much any, at any time we want. Um, but we try to follow coach's game plan and the plays the best we possibly can throughout the game. Landry? Uh, yeah, you know, he hit it on the head. We execute as much as we can. You know, we're not really blessed with having a whole bunch of seven-footers and being more athletic and more skilled than everybody else. So we got got it. You have to execute almost sometimes. Richard? Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest part of the game. You know, when you execute and do what you're told to and just make plays and uh, matchups easier for you to, uh, you know, get the best outcome. Over here. Uh, Landry, down here. Uh, Coach Marshall said that one of the better decisions he made this season was going with you, and it didn't obviously happen early. At what point did you think you were ready to take control? For Landry. Um, I mean, I've always had confidence in myself to you know, play either the one or the two. Uh, obviously, I was at that point when I did make the switch, I was starting to get really comfortable with the two. But um, you know, it was a fairly smooth transition because you know, Connor was playing it, and we're pretty interchangeable. So um, you know, we both can do a lot of the same things. And you know, it was smooth. I felt ready after maybe one game where it was kind of somewhat more of a learning experience and then getting confidence in my teammates and them getting confidence in me. Yeah, it's for all you guys. I asked Coach this last night. You know, Kentucky's known for sending guys to the NBA, but Wichita State now has two or three guys in the league. How much does that help, do you think, in recruiting now when Coach goes out and tells kids like you guys or whoever that, hey, we have multiple NBA guys? And when you chose Wichita State, did you – think, oh, this is a program that's got guys in the league and can help me get there? For sure. Um, I'd probably say make you appreciate the grind more. Uh, over four years, you see how you, you change your, grant, your game and you just craft your skills. Uh, I'd probably say the overall reward of you know, building yourself up as a complete player in four years probably is more appreciative than just jumping straight to the league. And some of them players are just more smarter players than them freshmen. So. I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, either way you get there is a blessing. So it's just how hard you want to work there. Landry? Uh, yeah, anytime you got, you know, that was a big reason why I came here. I wanted to play with Ron and Fred, you know, knowing they're two NBA guards. And, um, and when you can say that about your program, it's definitely going to be more attractive to people. Yeah, right here. Richard and Landry, how much have you looked at how good Kentucky is in transition and fast break and how important it will be to try to make them really go against the half-court defense? Landry? Oh, yeah, they, I mean, one of the best in the country, if not the best um, combination of, you know, speed and size and open court um, and pretty talented around the rim. So we're definitely, that's a point of emphasis for us, you know, trying to stop transition. You got three or four seconds really to, get back, cut the ball off, and you know, get the ball stopped and get into our set defense, which is where we think we're pretty good. Richard? Yeah, I um, mean, they're elite. Uh, you got the top 100 recruits coming to Kentucky. You got the Nike elite gear. I mean, they get all the Nike gear. So, I mean, they're elite in everything. So, I mean, we're just trying to be elite too one day, Nike. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are on a long winning streak. What, what factors have contributed to that? The, uh, the big long winning streak. Let's start with you, Connor. I think just getting better every single day. Um, not taking any day for any, for granted. Um, even after a win, we know we have to get back to work the next day and, and improve on on the mistakes we made the last game. Um, but like I said, just coming to get better every single day and, and working uh, on our weaknesses. Landry. Yeah, uh, what he said, you know, we, we got a great coach and he's also a coach that's rarely satisfied. You know, you can't really always make him happy, um, you know. So every day in film, even if we win by 20 or 30, he's, you know, ripping us or whatever about this player, that play. So that goes a long way. Um, you know, you're playing teams and, and you got to remain consistent with your preparation. And I think that's one thing that we like to hang our hat on. Right up here in front. If I remember correctly, before the 2014 game, your coach said that none of your players had even gotten a, a look or a form letter from Kentucky. Have, did any of you hear from them at all? And if not, what did they overlook in your skill set? Connor? 
Um, I committed to KU my sophomore year, so it was, it was really early for me. Um, I, I knew that's where I wanted to go when I, was, when I was younger, and I had that opportunity when they offered, so I committed early. So I didn't, I didn't get to um, experience the recruitment process that much, really. Landry. Yeah, they, they never talked to me. And Richard? Me either. Uh, I mean, probably because I'm not 6'11", you know, not 7, you don't have a 7'2 wingspan, but it's all good. Right, back here. Landry, watching Fred uh, last year, what kind of things did you pick up from him about the point guard? He's just, he was so patient, um, so under control, you know, nobody sped him up, nobody got him out of his, out of his rhythm or changed him from what he wanted to do. Uh, he was just always in complete control, and that's one thing I, you know, I'm still trying to get a handle on. And, um, you know, just staying at my pace, um, going at my speed, and, you know, controlling the game. Right back here, Jerry. Richard, you talked about not being 6'11", not having a 7'2 wingspan, not having the elite Nike gear. So how do you compensate for that in a game like tomorrow and, and you guys come out on top? Richard? Um, I mean, you just got to do the little things, you know. Uh, sometimes teams like that don't focus on boxing out, you know, checking down, you know, uh, defensive pressure, just little things that, w that make us great. And I think that's kind of what makes us appreciate uh, playing and working so hard more because we do a lot of little things that end up being – the big reason why we win. Questions, please, for the players. Is that it? Okay, fellas, thanks. Oh, Jerry, do you? Just one follow up, Rashad. You talked about Coach ripping you guys, even if you win by 20 or 30. Maybe it was Landry. Yeah. How much uh, are the little things the topic that he's ripping you guys about? Is that for Rashad? Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll have a win, but if we get beat on, like, the rebounding uh, total for the game, the film next day will be terrible. I mean, we'll win by 20, but you'll be every uh, thing in the book, you know? So it's just, he just pushed us every day. I mean, he just went the best from us, and uh, I kind of respect that from him. I mean, he just made, he made all of us, all 16 of us, uh, uh, he just helped us mold into men throughout the year, and we definitely appreciate that from him. Right here. Yeah, sorry, Landry, just to follow up on recruiting, what schools did you consider besides Wichita State when you chose them? Um, if I wasn't here, it'd probably be at Colorado. That's kind of the simplest answer. Uh, I don't, you know. All right, is that it? Thanks, fellas. And we'll have a coach here in about five minutes. Coach Marshall is on his way. Huh? Yeah, you here? Okay. Uh, Coach Marshall is here, so uh, for those of you in the media work area. Okay, uh, we'll get started for Coach Marshall. Right, right here. Greg Bob Lutz, Wichita Eagle. I asked the players and they gave a, what I, the reaction I expected, but do you ever look ahead in the bracket to see who's down the road potentially? And how much fun is it for you personally to be on this kind of a stage where you're playing some of these elite programs that you get to play here? 
Well, when the, when the bracket first comes out, the, the first thing you look at is what city are you going to and what day are you going to play? And uh, in this case, we were able to, last year we had to immediately pack up and basically leave Sunday night, Monday morning to get to Dayton to play Tuesday. And then we played Tuesday late night, Thursday late night, and the first game on Saturday in Providence, Rhode Island. But this year we got a lot more time to prepare for a Friday evening tip. Um, so we got to Indianapolis. We knew it was Dayton. We knew we had our hands full. So we poured the majority of our energy into that game from a staff perspective. But we also saw Kentucky. Uh, we saw UCLA, I think North Carolina, uh, Louisville or Kansas as a likely path to the Final Four. So uh, we, we just, you know, we're going to play it one game at a time. And uh, Kentucky and Northern Kentucky was a really good game last night. I thought John Brandon's team fought really hard, probably just missed too many shots. But Kentucky is expected, prevailed, and, and now we have a, an opportunity to play one of the great programs in the country. So we're excited, and uh, this will be a great opportunity for us, and we just need to go out and play well. Right back here. We were chuckling a little bit because the, some of the players were talking about wanting Nike elites to, to recognize them, and then you came in with a Nike elite shirt. It sounds a bit like they've got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder when it comes to that stuff, that, you know, big, bad Kentucky. Is that kind of the attitude you want them to have going into a game like this? Yeah, we have some Nike elite stuff, and I have to, you know, to take the big stage in order to wear it. Uh, uh, but we're, we're excited about that. Uh, yeah, we, we, our guys um, are not your five-star recruits walking in. They understand that uh, they came to our program for a reason, to, to, to win and, and get these opportunities and to get better and grow as, as people and students as, and players. But um, this is, you know, this doesn't get any better. You're playing Kentucky, and they're one of the handful of blue blood programs uh, in the country. And um, it's something crazy like if Kentucky UCLA and North Carolina have 20 something national championships between the three of them. So uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a road, but you, you, you gotta take one stop at a time. And, and the next uh, game is, is Kentucky on Sunday and, and we're excited about it. We'll go right over here. Uh, Greg, can you speak to what the, the coincidence that in 2014, you guys were the one they were the eight. The question was, you know, how can Kentucky be an eight? Now it's the complete reverse. John saying this, you know, how can Wichita be the ten? Uh, what do you think of that coincidence of this occurring with the same two teams three years apart? Well, wait a minute, John can't say that now because it was just two days ago well, he, when John was saying the seeds were perfect. I know, I know that. He can't go back on that. Well, he'll be here shortly. You can tell him. I, I already have. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. Um, you know. I they, they've got quite a sense of humor then, don't they? Those guys in that room. But uh, the bottom line is, um, you know, they're the, the only two guys that remember that game, other than you media people, are, are Coach Cal and I. Uh, everyone else is new. Uh, there might have been a couple of my guys that were freshmen at that point, but uh, I can't think of too many that played in that game that are going to be playing. And I think Willie Cauley-Stein is with Sacramento and Randall's with the Lakers, I hope. So, and, and I've got a few guys in the NBA from that, that group as well. I, I, we, in fact, we watched a little bit of that game uh, with our team today just to show them how we uh, countered Kentucky's size and athleticism. And, I mean, you, you saw Clee Anthony Early and Ron Baker and Fred Van Vliet and, and the Kentucky players that I just mentioned. It was, that, that court was full of NBA guys and uh, it was a tremendous game. And, I didn't even realize it until after the game what a great game it was because I hate giving up that many points. But the way they shot it, the way we shot it, it was back and forth. And it was after that game when everyone says, what a classic game. That may have been one of the best games in X amount of years in the tournament or the best game this year by far in the tournament. And uh, I didn't feel that. But what I, what, what I thought was really ironic that year is we were such a um, – polarizing team. We deserve a one seed, we don't deserve a one seed. And you're either on one side of the fence or the other, and then we get the one seed, but we get Kentucky as an eight. I think so. That, I think they hedged their bet a little bit. Um, but in the end, it took a loss 
to validate our team, which I think is really ironic and, and sad. Go ahead, Andy. So I know you started that answer by saying there's no players that are, were in that game, but yet then you said you actually used the game to exhibit that. How often do you do that to show teams how a coach coaches? Oh, we do that all the time. I mean, we, we show our team uh, what we can to best represent what they're going to see or what they're going to face in a particular game, how they're going to defend, what their, what their transition is like, what, their, what type of breakdown offense that they use. So we're trying to get our boys prepared for the mental part of the game, and uh, that's the last time we played them. All right. We're, we're going to go here and then. Greg Richard talked about little things as being a key component of what you guys do, like boxing out. How important are these little things to what you get done and, how, and in the tournament itself when the, there's good players, obviously, on, both, on every team? It's interesting, Jerry, that a lot of people, and, and, and even we, refer to them as little things, but those, aren't, those things aren't so little. Um, boxing out, communicating on defense, um, executing, setting a great screen, uh, being the first to the floor on a loose ball, those aren't little things, but those are things that you can control. And I think it's interesting if you talk to Fred Van Vliet and Ron Baker, those are some of the things that help them stick in the NBA. Obviously, they're great teammates and great, very talented players from a winning program, but they go to these, they were free agents, and they go to this veterans camp, and the coach keeps saying, man, they just keep doing the little things. They, they check down. If a big guy comes over and tries to block the shot, they come from the perimeter and try to box out the center who's left alone. Those are things that hopefully our guys learn in our program that not only help us win, but help them be better pros. It how, just how long does it take? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, it, it just depends on the player. You know, some of them come in much more in tune with what it's going to take to be a successful player in our program or at the next level. Uh, but some of them, it takes quite a while. And it's just repetition and repetition and uh, letting them know that not doing the little things, they get more time sitting over by me than doing them. And then they get to. Uh, exhibit all of their other talents and skills. Okay, over here. Greg, you mentioned all the NBA guys. Uh, how much does that help in recruiting now? When, like when you go into the living room, are you mentioning these guys right away? And do you notice, are you getting access to a different quality of player as a result of these NBA guys? Well, I think we are because you look at uh, Landry Shamit and Marcus McDuffie, for instance. Those two guys um, had some big time offers and they looked at the success that we were having as a program and then the individuals that were having success and going on to the next level. So it just, but it takes a while to build that. It hasn't been, it wasn't day one. We were selling a vision early. Now we're selling reality and what we have accomplished. Uh, Bob, you, you made an interesting point about one, playing Kentucky. Well, when we just redid our lobby in our locker, in our uh, office complex in the last three months, instead of talking about the Elite Eight team and what was it, 81, and, and, um, and not, not to take anything away from Xavier McDaniel and Cliff Levingston and Antoine Carr, we love those guys, but we started uh, exhibiting the, the people that we had played, a lot of the teams that we had played and beaten, like Arizona and Ohio State and Gonzaga, and you know the, the, we also had pictures of the Louisville game and the Kentucky game and the Kansas game and the Indiana game. That's who we've been playing. When you're a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 seed, that's who you get to play. And um, you know, we've seen very few Cal Polys like we did that first year uh, in, in, when we were the number one seed. Right here. Meyer McAfee is being Greg, we didn't see uh, some of the buzzer beaters or fantastic finishes we're accustomed to seeing in the first couple rounds uh, this year. What, what do you attribute that to, if, if anything? 
Uh, Myron, I can't answer that because I've been, you know, worried about Dayton. I've watched very few games. I mean, you're saying the games aren't close? Well, it's not some of the, you know, buzzer beaters and big upsets. And I don't know. Like it's just, I just think it's a, a fluke. Maybe you'll see more in the second round. I have no idea. And here and here. Greg, what stands out about Bam Adebayo down low, and what kind of matchup will that be like with, with him and Shaquille? Uh, what stands out about him? I mean, the obvious, he's a, he's a mountain of a man. I mean, he's just a huge guy, and um, he likes to jump in the air real high, higher than anybody else in the court, and dunk it through the basket. So you can't let him do that. It's, it's, you've got you to keep a body on him, and you've got to box him out, and, and uh, you've got to – put some doubt in his mind when he gets it low in the post, what's going to happen next. And, um, and, and, Sha and Shaq's got to be smart, and, and he's a little older and more mature, hopefully, and he can um, make him have to make some decisions how to guard us. Jerry. Uh, Greg, Kentucky's had some inconsistencies this year, individual players and also as a team, highs and lows in games. How much more difficult does that make a team to uh, – appraise and, and, and figure out when there's inconsistencies? Well, I can tell you this. When we show the video of Kentucky, we only show the shots that they make. So, uh, you know, our players probably think they make about 80% of all their shots. Uh, hopefully they don't do that. Hopefully they're all having bad karma tomorrow. Right here, Rick. Rick Botich, WDRB in Louisville. Greg, when you make a list of the important qualities in terms of winning a game, how high up does it rank being the aggressor and the more physical team? Very high. I mean, I, I talked to my team last night uh, about not at halftime. I thought we were sluggish. I thought we were on our heels. I thought Dayton was the aggressor. Uh, it appeared that some of the guys were in their first um, NCAA tournament, or even if they weren't in their first NCAA tournament, the new guys, if some of the, our returners were in new roles, if you will, they were more prominent players. They weren't the doo-wop singers in the background. They actually had the microphone and, and they were the lead. So they, and they played like that was their first time. So we were much more aggressive in the second half. I think that showed in our play. So hopefully that's beyond us now and we can, we can play well tomorrow from the giddy up. Right here, Tim. For those of your players who are not five stars, wh what are being overlooked? Wait a minute, which, those, which ones are five stars? Uh, I don't have a list in front of me. I'm assuming that the, you, You've got the least... list. It's on that piece of paper right there. <laughs> uh, for those who are not, or all of them, uh, what is being missed or overlooked about their abilities, or do you see that uh, some of the uh, elite, quote, programs are less willing to, to spend the time in developing them? Well, I don't, I don't know. I can't speak to the other programs about I'm, – I'm not sure that's the case. I'm sure that a lot of those programs would love to have some of our guys and develop them as players. Um, but they can get a bigger, faster, quicker, stronger athlete coming in the door and then develop them. And, and I think Cal's done a great job of that, uh, developing guys in one or two years so to get them NBA ready. And that's, that's maybe the difference. It takes those guys one or two years to develop NBA ready bodies and games where our guys maybe have a, 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 a not, not quite as high a starting point. So we have to develop a little more and um, – and, but but we're, we're sending some. We just haven't had the lottery picks yet. We're, but we, we, we may be working on that. Right back here. Greg, Marcus was talking about being able to guard Isaiah Briscoe from the start and kind of going back to their matchups in New Jersey. How versatile is he? He said he can basically guard one through four. Is he a guy you can use to, to guard basically anybody? Yeah, he and Brown uh, and, and Kelly, in fact. I think... That's one of the things that's been interesting about our team this year is um, Landry Shaman at six four and a half, Brown at six six, Marcus at six eight, and Kelly at six seven. All those guys can can guard basically one through four, and uh, it's given us some flexibility in our matchups and how we want to start games. Um, and I didn't even know Isaiah Briscoe was from New Jersey, but obviously he is, and they've, they've played against each other, so they're familiar with one another's game. 
Uh, yeah, we, can, we could put uh, Marcus on Briscoe. We could put him on Fox. We could put him on Monk. And that gives you a little flexibility from a defensive standpoint. Okay, Jerry, and then, yeah. Uh, Greg, you mentioned how Shaq is, a, is an older player, obviously more experienced than Bam. How, how can that show itself? Maybe not in that particular matchup, but how can a veteran savviness show itself against maybe a younger, talented player? Well, I mean, he's, this is his fourth NCAA tournament, and you know, he's played in a lot of NCAA tournament games. So, and he didn't play great yesterday. He, was, he made some silly fouls. Uh, he and Pollard were both fouling each other, and just two big guys down in the mud, you know, they're like mud wrestling down there. So we've got we've to get more out of Shaq tomorrow for sure. But Rano Nerger usually plays very well against big guys. He did it last year uh, in our win against Vandy. They had two seven-footers. One was a lottery pick and then Cornette and then uh, the uh, Tarzuski, uh, Zeus, and, and those big guys that Arizona had. He played beautifully against them. So he generally plays well against big guys. And then Willis, you've got a, we've got a three-headed monster at the five. So we're going to keep those guys fresh and and, uh, you know, Bam, I'm sure he's in great shape, but he's going to need to be in great shape tomorrow. Right here. Greg, you've kind of relished being a kind of a spokesman for the poorly seated and the little guys. Why have you taken that on? Why is that important for you to kind of speak up for that, that segment of college basketball? That's, that's where I've always, I mean, I've been doing this for 32 years, and Wichita State's the highest level that I've ever coached. So, um, and I... I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, every, everyone believes that in this room. If you don't raise your hand, we can have a discussion. But everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. And I don't know why they, they continually do it, but they do. And, and that's just the way it is. I, I think they keep saying that history, what you've done in the past, doesn't mean anything this year. And they just try to uh, weed, it, weed us out, if you will. And uh, teams like Middle Tennessee and St. Mary's and Wichita State, we're just, Gonzaga, we're just determined that that's not going to be so easy. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the deal for us. We want to make it really hard if that's what their in intent is. And it doesn't, you, know, you wouldn't think that's the case, but it certainly seems that way. We're just going to continue to make it as hard as possible for that to happen. Got time for a couple more. Right here. As a follow-up to that, how concerned are you in terms of the future of the tournament that there's less likely going to be a Cinderella Final Four run from a guys like you guys four years ago or Butler or whomever? Well, I, I think uh, there'll be a, a, a non-Power 5 team win the whole thing. And maybe Villanova, I don't know what you consider Villanova last year, but they're, they're not a Power 5, maybe a Power 6 if you want the Big East to be included in that. And they want, yeah, yeah. Well, Butler was close. We were very close in, in 13, but I, it's going to happen. It's going to happen one day unless they decide to exclude it and, and, and break off and have a different tournament or whatever. But um, I, I was watching television before I came to practice today, and the, the, it was on, either on CBS or ESPN. I don't recall which, but the whole thing was talking about the tournament, first, first, two, first round, both days. And the whole thing was about Middle Tennessee, Rhode Island, our game, and that's what was interesting. That's what they wanted to talk about. You know, they talked about the Michigan-Oklahoma State game a little bit, and, but, and, and the foul with, with Bandy, uh, but not, not much, that, not much else. That was what was interesting in the tournament. So I don't know why you would want to exclude that or, or diminish that in any way. Well, that, why are you so confident that that breakthrough will happen? Because there's good basketball being played at those, at those levels and, and good coaches and good players. And just as these guys have a chip on their shoulders, I'm sure Kermit Davis, his, his group has a chip on their shoulder. And uh, Giddy Potts is a really good player. And uh, those, those Aussies at St. Mary's, I mean, those are tough dudes. And, they're, and, and Gonzaga's pretty good. So I think it's going to happen. Last question right here. Greg, that said, does uh, tomorrow's game represent, represent something larger? I mean, with the you know, possibility that, you know, you're saying that you've been underseated, you're playing Kentucky, if you win, you know, the implications with maybe the committee in future years? I, I don't know what type of impact it'll have, Myron. I, I just know that we're going to try to play our best and win the game. And, um, 
and I'm sure Cal's group's got the same mindset. We both want to get to Memphis, and um, you know we've we're going to play as hard as we possibly can, and be gritty and grimy and tough and and, and active and energetic and passionate, and hopefully we make enough shots and 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 get a whistle every once in a while, and and um, and the ball falls our way. Thanks, Coach. See you tomorrow. All right. We have him spelled correctly in the high table. Yeah. So what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Oh, it's right there. Mark Frisco. Who is the one you just told me? Before. Thirty-five is Derek Willis. Okay. I'm still missing somebody. Oh, wait, no, that's it. Five, right? Yeah. Okay. For those of you in the media workroom, University of Kentucky will be bringing Bam Adebayo, Darren Fox, Derek Willis, Malik Monk, and Isaiah Briscoe.
something with Wisconsin, Villanova. The half. in hopefully another minute. Oh, we run a little behind. That mistake. <laughs> <laughs>
Kentucky players are on their way. All right, University of Kentucky athletes are here, and let's go right to the questions right here. Isaiah, Marcus, was, Marcus McDuffie was talking quite a bit about facing you in some of the New Jersey state title games. What do you remember from him and from those games playing them then and now? Question for Isaiah. Um, yeah, when we were in high school, we played against each other a few times, you know, in the state championship and things like that. You know, I'm just looking forward to getting out there and just playing against him again. Over here. A lot of the Wichita players were talking sort of about how you guys are the five-star guys, and it sounded like there was a chip on their shoulder about it. I'm sure you guys encounter that a lot. How do you, how do you deal with that? Do you deflect it, or do you kind of stick out your chest and say, you know, darn right we are? Got it. Bam, we'll start with you. Um, just, uh, you know, we just here to play basketball, you know, uh, stick with our teammates and just be together. Jaron? Like he said, we're going, we're going to play basketball. I'm not worried about what anybody says right now. Derek? 
Um, I mean, honestly, just uh, taking it game by game. You know, was prepared for um, a team yesterday, and now we're prepared for Wichita State, and you know, worry about ourselves and worry about what we got to do. So that's just kind of how we feel. Okay, questions, please. Right here. De'Aaron, uh, a couple weeks ago you were asked about what aspect of your game you were spending the most on in practice, and you said at the time it was your decision making. Can you kind of assess how that's been going and how important do you feel like that is the success of the team? Question for De'Aaron. Uh, it's going to be extremely important just uh, being able to take care of the ball, uh, help my team get in the scoring positions, you know, things like that. Um, you know, when I, when I cut down my turnovers, I feel like we have a greater chance of success, and uh, that's just with any player on the team. If we're not turning the ball over, uh, we're getting up more shots. We have more opportunities to make shots, more opportunities to get offensive rebounds and get second chances. So um, I was focusing on mine, but um, when I'm making good decisions, I feel like the whole team's been making good decisions. Questions for the players? Right here. Uh, this one for Bam. Uh, Coach Marshall, before you guys came on, said that he's going to be throwing several bigs at you to stop you. You're averaging a double-double in March. Also, the Wichita players seem confident that you're not going to have 18 rebounds against them tomorrow. Uh, what do you make of their confidence? And what do you see of Wichita State's big guys? Question for Bam. Uh, I just got to go out there and play hard. And, uh, stick with my teammates. Uh, they got confidence. and. Uh, we got high confidence, too. Questions, please? Right here. I'm Byron McKay, ESPN for De'Aaron and Malik. Uh, you know, it's often said that, you know, freshmen, you almost become sophomores this time of year as you mature. How much have you guys changed from, you know, the guys you were when you came in this, this summer to who you are now with this team? De'Aaron? Uh, coming in, we didn't really know much about it. Um, at least I can speak for myself. Uh, I didn't know much about it, how to run a team just yet. <clears throat> but uh, as the season has gone by, I've, I've learned. I've learned a lot of things. And uh, being a freshman isn't an excuse anymore, you know. Like you said, you know, we're basically sophomores now. So uh, we just got to go out and play. Malik? Just like he said, I, I ain't know too much about it. But I mean, we're here now. We got, we got comfortable with the system. We, we know what the, we need to do. So we just got to play. Questions? Right back here. Uh, you know, even even though uh, Wichita State does not have, you know, does not doesn't have that Power Five conference kind of brand about them. Uh, you know, they've done so much in the tournament in recent years. Well, what what's your perception, just as fans of college basketball, when you think about that program, you hear about it, see them play? Was this for any of the guys? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Isaiah, I don't know too much about Wichita State. Um, we our concern is us. We focus on us. You know, as long as we go out there, play with energy, play hard, and play Kentucky basketball, I think we got a great chance to win. Derek? Uh, I mean, just pretty much reiterating what Zay said. I mean, I ain't really seen him this year. I mean, we focus on ourselves. I mean, if we're watching basketball games, we don't even get to see the whole game. So it's like partially what you do watch. It doesn't even really, you know, factor in how you can form an opinion on someone. So, I mean, like I said, just worry about ourselves and, you know, worry about what we got to get done. Back at Andy? Uh, Malik, how would you describe how tough it would be to defend you guys when you, De'Aaron, and Bam are producing at a high level? Uh, Question for Malik. It's, it's, pre it's pretty hard to guard us anyway, but uh, just when all of us is producing, it's, it's, it's going to be hard. But I mean, we just got, like I said, we got to play basketball. Uh, just worry about Kentucky and we'd be fine. Right up here. This question for Bam, and it's related to an earlier question. When a Wichita State player in the locker room says about your rebounding, it's getting shut down. Greg Marshall says he hopes you're in good shape tomorrow because you're going to need to be. Does that affect or impact you at all when you know that there's a certain focus from a team that's going to be on you particularly, Bam? Uh, no, I just go out there and uh, just play my game, you know, have fun with my teammates, and, uh, just listen to Cal and listen to my teammates. Right here. It's for any of you guys, uh, Coach Cal last night was griping about playing a game at midnight. Does that really bother any of you guys, or is that just something about an old man griping? De'Aaron, <laughs> De'Aaron, let's start with you. Uh, we're all young. Uh, we ain't tired at midnight. So, uh, <laughs> they, I mean, they had to play at midnight, too, so it was just whoever brought the most energy. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I don't think you should, but uh, we were all right. Derek? I mean, it's just, you know, how the committee does stuff, so, um, 
you can't really worry about it. You still got to you know, take it game by game. And, you know, regardless, you still got to play the game. So just come out there, bring energy, and you know, that's all you can do. So, yep. Questions, please? Over here. For Isaiah, just getting back to those games against St. Anthony's, do you remember anything about McDuffie? What stood out about his game uh, from high school? Question for Isaiah. He's a he's a good player. Um, that's all I got. That's all I really remember. You know, I mean, he's a good player. Questions, please, right here. Derek, what do you remember of the uh, the 2014 tournament game with Kentucky and Wichita State? Derek. Um, I mean, just. Uh, Thought they was coached real well. Thought they ran a lot of really good schemes. I mean, players uh, that year. I know they had um, had some. I think some wing small forward player. I think it was early. Some, he was he was a really good player. And I mean, like I said, just played played really good together. And you know, came out and came down to it. And they got a nice shot off at the end. But you know, came away with the W. And like I said, just that's how how it went. I mean, just dog fight and we came out on top. All right. Anything else? Okay, guys. Thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Did you stop by? And there's also Harry and Izzy's too. You get shrimp cocktails too. Yeah. Are you at the JW? Sheraton. Sheraton Point? Uh, actually, Sheraton is another one. Bruce. Oh, really? <laughs> they actually upgraded that hotel about they upgraded the shirt in two or three years a few years a few years ago yeah the great location though Better than what was that hotel in Houston uh, when Butler was there? The Hall yeah. Oh, it's awful. It was close to the stadium, that was.
Seven twenty, Purdue nine forty to nine thirty. Yeah.
We believe Coach Calipari is on his way. Jesse, are we good? Okay. Coach. All right, Coach Calipari is with us. Raise your hand, Jerry. We'll get started right away, right here. Scott, how late did you stay up last night, and how do you feel about two games within less than 48 hours? Well, last, last night, looking at my watch, is why that I had the response I have right now. I'm just worried about coaching my team in this next game, and they probably didn't get to bed till one in the morning either. Um, ours was a little bit later than that, but um, <coughs> two good teams <coughs> going at each other should be interesting. <coughs> okay, question, please. I do need that water. I don't think I did. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Questions, please, right back here. You know, most, most observers, when they think about this matchup, of course they think about the game three years ago. What, what do you remember most about that game uh, other than winning it? Well, it was a long time ago, thank you. And uh, I haven't watched it. Um, I watched it after the game. I know Julius Randle was really big in that game, if I remember right, but a lot of players played well. Uh, and their team played well. They had the last shot to win the game. So it's a good, it was a good battle. Andy? Uh, John, Greg said he showed that tape to this group of Wichita State players to just show them what it's like to go against a Kentucky team and Kentucky Bigs, even though the players are different. Uh, what are the chances you could do that to show what a Wichita State team coached by Greg Marshall 
uh, is like? I, there's all kind of ways of doing this, and uh, it's just not something I would do because the players are all different. And, you know, I'm just worried about us playing at our best. We're going to have to have a heck of a game to win the game. We know that. And uh, play better than we played yesterday to win the game. They're talented. They're big. They're physical. They're strong. They're veterans. It's a good team. Tim? There seems to be a, an undercurrent of resentment among the uh, mid-majors about both the, the tournament bracket and the seedings. Do you think they have a legitimate beef? Well, there's a couple things. I, I was at those schools, and I used to always say you can't put them all in one pocket because it doesn't give a group a chance to advance. Um, then you had VCU and this team and that team in the Final Four, and it, you know what I'm saying? So then it was the other way. What's happened right now is the fifth year transfer has changed and made it tough for some of those schools that are building. It hadn't affected Gonzaga, it hadn't affected uh, Wichita, it hadn't affected uh, some of the other schools, but the reality of it is that's the issue and I wish we could deal with it. Um, you know, it's just guys are losing their best players their fifth year. You know, guys are losing jobs because kids are leaving and going to a, a major school. Uh, uh, I would say that's having more of an, an effect on those programs than anything else. I just, you know, I can't imagine we can't come up with a solution that you have to sit out. If you transfer, you sit out. It's just what it is. I mean, whether you graduated or not, you sit out. Um, from what I understand, there are programs that have the names of all the kids that have a chance at transferring and playing right away. Who can we grab out of that? Come on. The problem is those kids play for a coach whose job may be on the line. So you take those kids and now all of a sudden that guy loses his job. It's just, I don't think it says the right thing to the kids. I know it's not right for coaching, and, but we'll be mad about one and done. Really? Okay, right over here. John, Wichita State really kind of took off in mid-January when they made Landry Sham at the point guard. What are your impressions of, of him and how he's playing and how he's really he does? good. He's really good. He's fearless. You know, he's he's not afraid. Can shoot it. Uh, runs their team. Um, he's good. He's a good player. Right here, Cal. What what has it been like this year to to finally coach your own son? Just the experience of. I know he's been around all your programs forever, but I haven't been practice, and, and that different dynamic for you. Well, um, being a walk-on in this program is the hard, is a very hard thing because it's hard to get on the practice floor, let alone the, the floor. And when Hami came, he kind of had to take a little more of a back seat. Um, but, you know, I'm watching him, and I love the fact that he's in the gym early. He comes on off days. Um, that he's working on his game. He's trying to be a great teammate. Um, you know, my wife's on me all the time. You're up 21. Why didn't you put him in? Come on. Um, but he's, uh, it's just nice being around him, like when we travel. And, you know, it was my birthday down in Alabama, and I was feeling awful. I'm in the room by myself, and I called him. I said, hey, come on up here. Why? Because I'm in here by myself. I just... Come on up. Dad, please don't make me come up there. So, uh, but it's, you know, he still brings clothes over to wash to his mom, though. I know he does that. It's probably against the NCAA rules, but he does it. Jerry. John, Wichita State made, uh, talked about doing the little things, like boxing out, rotating on defense. How well do you guys do those things? How well do they do them? And how... What difference could that make? Well, I've watched four tapes of theirs, and I can just tell you that they, uh, they viciously go after offensive rebounds. If you don't rebound the game, you don't have a chance to beat them. Um, they also uh, are not afraid to go inside. They'll be physical when you drive. I mean, you're not getting a clear drive. You're going to have a body on you, something on you. And it's those, that kind of game that's just a competitive 
you know what it's going to be. And you love walking into those kind of games. Know how good they are. You got an unbelievable opponent who plays with heart and fights and battles, and you bring your team in, your young team, and say, let's see what we are. Let's see where we are at this point. Our team has gotten better. We really have. But we still, they're, they're gaps. And if you have a gap against this team, it'll be bam, 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 timeout. What just happened to us? Let's get this back in order. So uh, I'm looking forward to it just because I know how good they are and that it's going to be a hard game. And I want to see how my young guys respond. Go right here. John, you seem to be working real hard on coaching your team on the court. You're pretty animated on the sidelines. And yet just not as three... much as I've been, but that's I'm I'm not watching myself either, so I, I would tell you not as much as I've been, but go ahead. Well, two two or three weeks ago, you were focusing on the importance of empowering your team. Have you just accepted the fact that this is a group that may need your guidance a little bit more down the stretch? Well, here here's what I would say. They I think they are empowered. I've empowered my staff. Um, maybe there are times, though, that I'm looking at this game and saying, we could lose this game, and then I'm going to stand up. This is the end of the year now. This is like when you lose, you fall off the cliff. So if I have to stand up and yell and grab, and do, I'm, I'm going to do what I have to to try to help the team win. At the end of the day, though, this has got to be what they want, not what I want. I've got to be on, this has got to be me being on a ride with them. I'm just here to, I told them today, you're prepared for this moment because of what we've done all year. We've worked on all the things that you're going to have to do in this game to do it. Now you're going to have to perform. And you're going to have to want to be on that stage. And you're going to have an opponent that absolutely believes they can beat you and they're coming at you and they're not going to give you an inch. Do you want it any other way? We know how hard the game's going to be. This is, this, is, uh, this is a sweet 16 Elite Eight game that we're playing. But that's okay. Over here, John. John, on, on that subject, how uh, better prepared do you feel like your team is now for a physical, grinded out type game than it was earlier in the year? Or do you, or do you think it is prepared yeah, for that type that of game? Yeah, we, we are. But again, they play fast now. They're, they're trying to score. And, and they'll press and do some different things to try to muck up the game. And, um, you know, sometimes they hard show and pick and rolls to just make you get you out of rhythm. They, uh, you know, pressing different ways on the ball, off the ball, quick trap, try to steal, go back. I mean, so, uh, you know, we're, we'll, we'll figure out how ready we are tomorrow when it's tipped off at 240. We'll, we'll see. Um, but like I said, we're um, when you got young guys, you just hope they want this moment. They want to play in this kind of moment. Jerry? Yeah, Malik struggled, obviously, with his shooting last night. And then it's been several games. What do you <coughs> see? Are de defense is playing him differently? Or no. is the confidence level not quite well, there? Well, he, he didn't practice this week because of his um, he had a uh, lower back butt bruise, whatever you want to call it. So he didn't practice for two days. Um, but I, I, what I liked was that he took twos, he drove the ball, he made free throws. Um, because you're not going to be on every game. So you just don't take 12 threes then. You're not on today. Get the ball to the basket, get fouled, take twos. He's a great two-point shooter. And um, they'll still play him to three because he could make seven in a row. You know, he's one of those ones you say, man, he's due. Let's just hope he's due. Come on. He's had about three games where he hadn't made some shots. So, but it's, it's nice when you have Dom, when you have Derek, when you have Michael, that he doesn't have to make threes. He just, he doesn't, not for our team. De De'Aaron Fox is making threes now. So... If he does, it's great. If he doesn't, make sure you defend and rebound and take twos and get fouled, and, and then we'll see if it's the next game. He'll break out at some point because he's too talented and he's got too much of a – he's got a great spirit about him. Back in the back. 
Brett Gallagher with a CBS affiliate in Louisville. How has Briscoe fit into the puzzle this year? What is, how has he been the difference? I think he's, his leadership, his defense, his toughness, his rebounding, uh, his ability to get in the lane. I mean, if your team is not attacking that lane and he gets in 16, 18 times a game, he's, his feet are in that lane. There's unbelievable value to that. Shooting free throws better, shooting the ball better the last uh, week or so. And, um, you know, he, his ability to create shots for his teammates. But more importantly, he just comes up with balls. And one we needed yesterday, he's the guy that dove on the floor and scooped it. And he's, uh, he's really become that well-rounded player that uh, I would have hoped. And, uh, you know, this is uh, – and he's, and he's playing with young guys. Like, he's the guy – he's the old guy. He's like 20. He's the old guy. So, we have time for two more right here. Coach, just to follow up on the Isaiah thing, do you think because of what you just said about his style of play that when he, if he gets to the NBA eventually he'll succeed more there because of NBA rules, he can get to the rim and things like that? He's going to be fine. He's got the body, he's got the physique, so that's not an issue. He's going to have to get in the gym and his shot's going to have to be more consistent. But you know how many guys go in that league with that as the one thing? When you handle the ball like he does, when you're as tough as he is, that's winning basketball. <laughs> Got to shoot the ball better. All right, get in the gym, shoot a thousand a day, make a thousand a day. Same on, you know, getting to the rim. You're right; it's the court's a little more open, but he's got those traits and all those things that he does in his game. Last question right here. With Wichita State playing a different game yesterday t from, the, from their typical body of work this season, does it change how you prepare for them with such a short window? Say, say it again. With the you know, Wichita State playing a different game than they typically play. But is it as like, far like, as what? Like grind it out, close game where they won like 20-something games by 15 to 20 points. Does that, uh, does that yesterday's game change? How you'd look at it? No, you just you're, you're looking at a group of games and, and and maybe each team how they played them, what they tried to do to them, what worked, what didn't work. Is there anything they did offensively to them? I mean, you're just kind of picking out some stuff. But on a quick turn like this, I mean, if I'm spending all my time worried about Wichita, I know how good they are. I know how talented they are. I know they're veteran. I know how tough. I got to worry about my team playing their best. If they don't do that, then it's done. If we play our best, let's see if that's good enough. We don't know. We'll see, though. Thanks, John. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.